My name's Danny Lee, um, and we're here tonight to spend the next hour or so talking about the migration uh, of film critics into filmmaking and to try and pin down, if we can, I suppose where the borders lie between those two uh, activities. So I have a fine panel of polymaths with me here to do that tonight. Um, you've met Jonathan already, um, who obviously as well as being the director of Lesenza, has a double life as one of uh, Britain's most prominent film critics. Um, Chris Petty is here, director, uh, a novelist and lapsed film critic, I suppose is probably the best way. Is that a fair description? Lapsed? Yeah, Can we go with that? Fine. <laughs> um, Charlie Lyne, um, who founded the film blog Ultra Culture and has just finished, or is just finishing, his first, his first feature as a documentarian, uh, Beyond Clueless, and Hannah Patterson, scriptwriter, playwright, and sometime film journalist as well. So uh, there's a huge range of experience here. Um, I suppose the first question I wanted to ask people really was, was to what extent they embraced the label of film critic. Um, we're here to talk about critics and filmmakers. Obviously, everyone here is a filmmaker, but is everyone here a critic? I'm going to start with you, Jonathan. Um, and, and also, do, what you understand, what we understand now at, at this point in kind of film history by the, by the phrase critic. Yeah, actually, it's an interesting point because, um, yeah, I regard myself as a film critic because uh, the, the greatest part of my journalism is, is writing criticism of films, you know, rather than... I mean, I do features, I do interviews, whatever, but the thing that I've always found most exciting is is writing criticism. Um, and it's something that, you know, when you find you can kind of give it a personal spin, and I mean, I've been doing it for a long time and sort of developing a voice, uh, and... Um, it kind of becomes a narrative. I mean, if you do it week in, week out, it kind of becomes a narrative and it becomes a dialogue with yourself and with the films you see, and they sort of become uh, a part of you. And it's like a way of having kind of an extended argument. And I guess, historically, um, film critics who have become filmmakers have tended to say that um, making films, is, you know, it also becomes... A sort of criticism because it becomes a way of carrying on that argument and that discussion with the films you see, but doing it um, in images rather than in words. Uh, yes, I mean, I haven't written half as much as Jonathan has in terms of criticism, but um, I would say I do think there's a, I mean, I think there's a distinction between film reviewing and film criticism, and I think that that's probably to do with how much you, your, your knowledge of the history of, of the medium and how much you engage with that when you're writing about it. So I would say criticism, I think. Um, and I think that you are often referencing maybe other mediums as well within that. So, yeah, I, I, I would use that term. Okay. Charlie Lyon. Yeah, I think, ironically, uh, given that it is what allowed me to get into making films, uh, I was incredibly reluctant for a long time to actually call myself a critic, partly because that seemed like a very weighty thing to ascribed to myself but also because it had this connotation of like once you're a critic you're a critic and because I'd always wanted to make films the idea that I might admit to that and that that would then mean like okay you're in the critic graveyard now and you can never <laughs> like create anything um, but actually I think once I kind of calmed down about that and got my head around the idea that being a critic and being a filmmaker weren't necessarily exclusive ideas uh, yeah, I think it was, inc you know, I don't think there's any conflict between those two things now. Um, and in fact, I think I don't think there's much of a high barrier to get over before you can call yourself a critic either. In fact, I would slightly disagree. I think, to be honest, anyone, if you're writing about film or you're writing about any art form, is a critic. I think it's almost a shame that there's this sense that you have to sort of graduate from something to call yourself that, that it's an achievement. And it's the same with filmmaker as well. I think a lot of people, when they see critics becoming filmmakers, expect you to achieve a certain amount before you can, you know, rightly call yourself that. It has to be earned, which I think is a shame. Chris Petty? Um, it was the only job I've ever got fired from, so I was quite proud of that. I was fired from Tatler as their film reviewer. And before that, I wasn't really a critic because I was um, something called film editor, time out, which meant that I could actually duck huge amounts of stuff. So there was loads I never had to write about. I never had to write about Bergman. I never had to write about Tarkovsky. And 
I knew very early on that I wasn't a vocational critic because I would have been incapable of writing about Bergman and probably incapable of writing about Tarkovsky. So I knew that I had to move on pretty quickly before I was found out, as indeed I was at Tatler. So um, that sort of, that ended that. I was going to ask, I mean, you have to tell us what you got fired from Tatler for. Reviewing too well. <laughs> Ref re uh, refusing to review the Alan Parker film. The thing about Tatler was you worked to, to a very far ahead deadline. And um, I... <sighs> I always managed to pick the film which never actually came out. And, <laughs> and I kind of refused to review the Alan Parker film, which did come out. So they kind of, they worked out pretty quickly that I was no good at kind of guessing. And, and I think I, I kind of kept it going for a few more months, but then I think I, re I, I devoted a whole column to, to uh, Less Than Zero, the, the uh, Brett Easton Ellis film. Uh, and the other thing I refused to do was say whether I liked a film or not. That, that, that in, a, in a way, I, I, I made a point of, A, not, not telling the story, because everyone does that, and also, B, not saying whether the film was any good or not. So I, I, my, my days were numbered. <laughs> I mean, again, another question for, for all four of you, really. Having made that jump into filmmaking, how self-conscious did you feel about, you know, Charlie, you were talking about the kind of the terrible baggage, it sometimes seems like, of, of, of having a past in criticism. Was there a moment where you sort of shrugged off that feeling of self-consciousness, or did it sort of, I mean, Jonathan, again, I mean, we've seen a centre now. I mean, at what point in the process did you feel, OK, now I'm a filmmaker, I am no longer merely a critic, or is that a kind of false distinction anyway? Merely a critic. Well, mm. <laughs> Did you um, use the merely fairly deliberately? I know what you're saying. saying. I know what you're saying. Um, I don't know. I mean, um, it took me long enough to, to get around to thinking I was a critic. So um, I, I still haven't sort of caught up with the idea of being a filmmaker. But um, mm, self-conscious, yeah, well, maybe. Because um, I think... Probably, you know, I, I think when I was making the film, I, I wasn't thinking of myself as a critic making the film, but at the same time, I know I'm thinking like a critic in that, you know, if I see it now, I'm sort of thinking, hmm, why did he do that? And why didn't he do that? I would have done that. Oh, actually, I did do that. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess there's always going to be a self consciousness there, but I think if anyone watches films critically, whether they're writing about them or not, there's going to be a sort of self conscious. I mean, you know, is there anyone in the world? who makes films completely unselfconsciously, consciously and, and if there is, maybe they shouldn't be, because that would be a very weird thing to do. Yeah, but you could have somebody who makes something for the love of it and doesn't constantly have that voice saying, oh, it should be artier, or it should be sort of trying to be something else. I was going to ask about the voice. And I, think that, I think you have that pressure sometimes, or you put that pressure on yourself sometimes. I think if, if you have that whole history of... Of film and criticism, then you're constantly thinking about that. Those references are always there. But you know, I, I think, think those are not going to be sort of art people doing that. I think the people who, who are most likely to be asking those questions are the most commercial filmmakers who are going to be saying, actually, it needs to be this because they're going to like this in, you know, Idaho or Korea, and actually they want they want more monsters and more CGI. So they like the same in things Japan in Idaho this year. And Korea. Yeah, but you know what I mean. It's it's. Um, those are, the, those are the kind of self-conscious questions that people are going to ask, you know, if they're looking at the market. But, you know, I think somewhere in the world of cinema, there are a few kind of happy souls who have no idea about the market at all and not interested. And, you know, we'll make those kind of eight-hour films that two people want to see, and they will be perfect. They're, they're the unselfconscious ones. It's interesting. I mean, the, the, the voice is, is something I wanted to get at, so I'm glad that came up early, because actually, I mean, I've heard people say, in lots of different creative fields, you have to shut off that voice. And actually, the, the critic's voice is the voice which, for a lot of people, impedes creativity because it's constantly second-guessing it, constantly saying, well, that's not quite good enough. What you perhaps want to do is... So, so how difficult is it to shut off the critic's voice when you're a critic? I mean, in a way, I think I would disagree with you that you have to shut it off. I think it's incredibly useful. Um, whether you're writing criticism or making a film, um, or at least in my limited experience of both, I found that that constant self-doubt is the thing that makes me improve things. And so, you know, I'm very close to finishing my film at the moment and I'm watching it over and I'm still, you know, horribly disappointed with it and I think it's terrible. But in a way, the fact that I think it's slightly less terrible than I did six months ago is a clue to me that, you know, it's getting there. Um, I would worry if I started thinking that anything I'd created, whether it was criticism or a film, was 
just completely perfect and didn't need any more work doing to it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't think that critical faculty is exclusive to critics. I think any creator in any field worth their salt would have a certain amount of that in order to strive to improve. Chris Petty, I mean, Radio One was the first one you made, 1979 at that point, and that was pretty much straight after you finished at Time Out. Um, again, it sounds like you had less of a kind of calling to criticism than, than the other three on the panel, but was it easy to shrug off five years of, of pr kind of professional expertise in the trenches at Time Out? Well, um, I avoided the trenches pretty much by getting other people to review the films. But, um, I mean, I think the, fil the films you make are obviously a product of the films that you view, inevitably. But actually, in the end, filmmaking is an intensely practical experience. There's often not time to think. And, 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 and most of the discussions you have with the people making the film with you are actually kind of intensely practical. It's not to do with, with, with the concept of the film or, or, or... And normally the decisions you do make of, oh, I'd quite like this and that, you're told, well, no, you can't have it. There's only kind of two hours to do the shot. Um, and so most of your decisions are, are really kind of to do with trying to keep the crew happy in terms of their meal times and their breaks uh, and answering questions like, do you want the red socks or the yellow socks? And you say, well, um, the yellow, of course. And then two, day, <laughs> two days later, you're, you're kind of looking at this shot being shot, and you think, why is that actor wearing yellow socks? And then you think, well, actually, it doesn't matter because the film's in black and white. But... <laughs> so it's not, it's not a kind of... It's not, it's not a particularly intellectual experience. It's just you're kind of desperately trying to solve uh, problems that you're kind of constantly presented with, normally by the weather or, or, or you know, that there's... there's and, and I'm always, I quite enjoy the fact that on, on film sets, the, the discussions are actually, you know, no one ever discusses, oh, did you see this or did that, or we're going to do it like this. Um, so the, the, the process is kind of entirely schizophrenic, which I think, is, it, but this is maybe just a defense mechanism to kind of not to involve the, um, because if the critical half operated, it would just be looking on in complete dismay at what you were doing. Well, I suppose there's two things, aren't there? Because there's your own critical faculty and the kind of the critic's voice which is ticking away in your own head, but also the knowledge of the, of the mechanics of reviews and the fact that there will be reviews. Um, and how, I'm wondering how difficult it is not to anticipate what those reviews are going to be, because you will have seen so many times, each of you, what other critics will be looking for. Yeah, but what, they'll what... get it wrong. Well, of course, of course. But then you still have to live with that. They still got it wrong. <laughs> I mean, for all four of you, it's a question. I mean, when you're in, you know, again, to use the, the trench analogy, when you're there in the trench, knee-deep in mud, how hard is it not to expect, not to anticipate, I don't know, um, Christopher Tookie's take on this in the Daily Mail, for example? No, I would, I would to be honest, I'd relish a, a bad review or a good review or anything. I'd relish any reviews that actually put some thought into it because I think that's one of the most flattering things anyone could do about anything you make is actually spend time with it and think about it. Um, I think even if my instinct was to react negatively and go, oh, you just didn't understand it, you don't know how much work went into it, I would intellectually force myself not to be that person because I've seen that happen so many millions of times and I find that so frustrating when someone who's very outspoken about artistic works of any kind makes something and then goes, oh, now I understand that it's actually fucking difficult to make a film, and so I no longer have any critical faculties, and I, all films are now brilliant because I've made one. Um, so I think anything that stops me becoming that person, and if that means I'm dealing people, with a bad review, that's fine. People sort of go over to the dark side. I've noticed with um, you know, rock critics who become musicians, they then become incredibly hostile towards critics. The, the phrase, you don't know how difficult it is to make a film, is one of the most irritating you can possibly So, so but I'm interested, in, I'm interested in that, because actually there's a sort of mood, everyone seems incredibly sanguine about, about the entire process and about the prospect of being reviewed, but actually you're right. I mean, maybe we've just got a lucky foursome here, but actually I can, I'm sure we can all think of examples here. There's a couple of fairly glaring ones which bring to my mind are people who are very outspoken, in fact, and very outlandish almost in the kind of uh, ferocity of their reviews, who then have got very, very prickly indeed um, when their works have been challenged. And rather than saying, actually, everything is wonderful, they've become very defensive and very... And so I'm just... I'm, again, I'm, I'm trying to get at whether there's going to be that moment of, of kind of peaked outrage on, on any of your parts as well. 
Hannah? Nobody ever reviews the screenwriter, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but the projects that you've made have been reviewed. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, to be honest, I mean, I have that more in theatre, because as the writer, you're, that's the, the reviews mainly, if it's new writing, it's mainly about that. But in film reviews, people don't talk about screenwriter. And I do think it's quite interesting, actually, because I would say, since writing films, that my criticism has changed, and I would now try and talk about the screenwriter. In a, in a review or in a, in a piece that might be about the industry, much more than I would have done before, because I think that is something that's quite a neglected area. But that's obviously sort of my area, so I sort of find that quite interesting, and it's not something, you know, it's usually the director that talks about most in film. But it's nice of the writer to get talked about at all, I know, but what if, mm. the, what if the script stank? I mean, would you, how comfortable would you feel drawing attention to that? I, um, what, in a review mm. of somebody else's script? Yeah, of someone yeah. else's script. Um, I, I, would, I hope that I would talk about it. In, I mean, I wouldn't just say it stank, probably. Hopefully I'd sort of try and talk about it in a, you know, um, critical way, so to talk about why it worked or didn't. I mean, I think that's always difficult, though, with a screenplay, because you don't know what's happened to it. You don't yeah, know well, who no, else has read it. And it's always the logic with actors so as well, as you yeah. never know what's happened to them in the edits. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. it's difficult to, to, to pick on yeah. in that sense. I, just, I do think there are certain screenwriters that are, are sort of auteurs in their own way. So, you know, they've done certain kind of work that you start to get a sense of their themes and, you know, it's, it actually can have, could, could be discussed in a certain way. Sure. I suppose I'm just interested in that idea of whether making film... I mean, Charlie, you're always speaking quite kind of ardently about, about not softening up and not letting the filmmaking experience soften you up as a critic. And yet, I mean, I found, as soon as I've set foot on a film set, I found it... it altered my perspective, whether I liked that or not, because suddenly you realise quite how much, even in the most terrible film, quite how much anguish and quite how much very sincere kind of creativity and energy is going into this thing. And it is very difficult to then not pull back. And well, not pull your punches exactly, but I mean, I mean perspe being... human perspective is a terrible thing for a critic, because you suddenly realise <laughs> that actually everybody's trying their best, and that's, that's awful, isn't it? I don't know, doesn't it speak to a sort of weird psychopathy in you that you couldn't imagine that before you went <laughs> like, like you just thought that films just ended up on the screen and yeah but it's like the curtain being pulled back in the wizard of oz i mean when you actually see it for yourself and you think oh no that's actually, they're being they're actually paid, people, I mean, aren't they like just, like you've just got you, 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 know you know it's they're not they're not like aid workers Your fault it's not always that, that hard a job like i mean it, it's hard obviously but how deep is your sympathy for the filmmakers of the world that you feel like you need to sort of wrap them in cotton wool. It's also the most dangerous <laughs> thing you can do as a journalist, I think, to go on a film set because there is this sort of mystery about it and there is a sort of weird thing happens where you feel, oh, I've been on the set, I'm kind of part of this film, I feel strangely close to it, and you shouldn't be, you know, it kind of stops you <laughs> keeping your distance. And, and um, you know, this has happened to me a couple of times that I've, I've, I've been on the set and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm sort of feeling really involved with this film because I see how it's coming along. And then... PRs in particular will sort of say something to you that suggests that they see you as part of it. Oh, thanks for coming along and working with us. And you think, oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to cross that line. I'm not going to be pulled into this process because as a critic, you do have to keep a distance from that because, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of... It's the, you know, criticism is sort of disappearing anyway. It's sort of being sucked into the PR world. And that's certainly the thing that that criticism and, and I think, you know, film journalism in general has to resist this idea that, you know, we're all part of, of the effort and, like, you know, it's one big jolly rap party. Well, that's always struck me as one of the big differences between, between journalism of all the descriptions, really, but particularly in this case film journalism and filmmaking, which is this sort of branch of show business, essentially, is that, that for the best reasons, making films has to be this kind of collaborative process and everybody has to get along and then everyone supports their work afterwards. And so the BAFTAs come around and everybody votes for the films that either they worked on or that their friends worked on. And that's how it all exists because everything's at this kind of breadline level. And there's this awareness, particularly in Britain, that if everyone doesn't help each other out and support each other, the whole thing's going to sink. And then you layer this sort of general sort of showbiz camaraderie on top of that. Journalism obviously has to be very, very different. So, I mean, as people who've existed on both sides of that divide, I mean, how stark is that difference between yeah. the relatively Hobbesian world of uh, film journalism, in which, speaking personally, you have no friends, and the, <laughs> the world of, of filmmaking in which you have to have friends and you have to, again, in a very sincere and open-hearted way, you have to support each other because otherwise the films die and sink and nobody ever sees them. Chris? Well, uh, it, it, it takes just as much effort to make a bad film as it does to make a good film. So, If not more so. If not... Mm, yeah, possibly more. The other thing about reviewing is that 
very few reviews actually really tell you anything. You know, they, they either like it and so you're pleased or they don't like it, so you're not pleased. But very, very few actually really tell you anything. And, and a good example was that when Radio On was released on DVD in 2008 or so, after a long fallow period, actually everyone more or less said the same thing. I mean, they were nice, they rolled over for it. But it was definitive post-punk movie. It doesn't tell you very much, but it's kind of used as a term of approval. And I think the thing with, with criticism, there's very, very few reviews which really nail a film, uh, whether it's your own or somebody else's. And, and I think that generally um, that's becoming rarer. There's very little dissent now. I mean, there may be rants and there may be... But, but there's a kind of consensus. And I went to see American Hustle the other day and I kind of thought, well, is this the film they're all talking about? So what's changed in that case? Everything's flattened out. I mean, that, that I think that everything has become an extension of everything else. That, that as you say, that, that, that you have to support, you have to support the British film industry. Why? You know, what, what, why, why can't you be rude about things? <laughs> and um, the criticism, I think, is, is, it used to be a rather kind of lonely, introspective, business and, and nobody cared about you because you kind of had dandruff and wore corduroy jackets and now, now you have to have a personality photograph at the top of your column so you've kind of got to look you know, like how people think critics look and you have to kind of write in a certain way and, and it's informed and it's smart and, and it's, it's like a restaurant review really it's, it's, you know, it's saying I think I, also there's more of it. That's the thing. I mean, oh, you the know, number. Well, in the num well, terms of the number of films. Yeah. Well, well, there, there are more films, but there are more people writing about films, more people talking about films. And you know, when I started, which is a very long time ago, I don't like to think how long, but there wasn't a great deal of writing about film. There was a big divide between the um, newspaper critics who were held to be, you know, really very, you know, sort of dignified and authoritative because they'd been doing the job for sort of 30, 40 years or whatever. And, um, you know, a few listings, magazines or whatever. Um, well, with, with the massive explosion of talk about film um, and, you know, people blogging and, you know, I mean, you, you, Twitter has really kind of raised the roof of this because as soon as you come out of a film, as soon as you come out of a screening, um, everyone is tweeting. And if you go to a festival, you come out of Cannes, and by the time the end credits have rolled on a competition film, you know, there are thousands, I don't know, millions of tweets about, you know, uh, uh, the new Von Trier masterpiece, you know, within 20 seconds of the film ending. So the consensus forms there and then straight away and it's either sort of for or against but it very quickly solidifies. It very quickly becomes you know, a matter of gospel that American Hustle is you know, the film to end them all. Um, so the idea that there's any kind of you know, slow burning debate or that the arguments are more interesting or the arguments are more complex um, I mean I, I started tweeting a while ago and I absolutely, you know, love it. It's, I find it completely addictive and, you know, it's great for, for you know, that, that bad joke that otherwise you tell someone on the way out of the film and then you wish you hadn't and you sort of put it up there and then and it's done. But it means that the kind of the word on any film is now fixed within 30 seconds of the first press screening and I think that's very dangerous because it means that opinions aren't sort of slow burning. But is that something that's changing? Because I always used to think on the odd occasions I used to go to, to the national press shows, which was sort of the weekly, the real hardcore circuit for the national press critics. I mean, I used to, particularly with comedies, you know, I used to, to scan the ranks of, of critics and think, actually, if I was the director of this film, I would feel like running across Hungerford Bridge and throwing myself in because there is no way my film can survive this. So is what you're saying that, that what's now taking place just groupthink on a larger scale or has the dynamic actually changed? Because there used to be, and the groupthink used to be, I mean, back into the 80s and 90s, I mean, you still had with the exception of someone like Alex Walker, who was this kind of a kind of classic presence on the standard, you had most of the same critics saying most of the same things. And if your, and if your film wasn't received well almost immediately, you well, were done for. Well, and also you say there wasn't like a public forum for them all to compare opinions on, but it does seem that, you know, if, it, if the 1980s, 1990s uh, film critic circuit was anything like it is now, 
all you would have had was all these people turning up on a Monday morning to watch a new release film and then gathering in the lobby afterwards to compare notes. Surely the critics didn't have to wait to read each other's reviews before they knew what the consensus on a film was. They could just stand around and listen to the air. Yeah, but I don't think people ever really... I mean, you know, even now, people do not come out of those screenings and say, you know, OK, what are we all going to say? Um, very often people think they do, but I actually the reason people ended up saying the same things with all of those films is because um, people who had been doing that job for years would come out and every week, you know, they'd come out on a Monday morning and they'd watch right through till Wednesday afternoon. So, I mean, now you can see something like 10 films a week. And if people are doing that week in, week out, which, you know, thank God I ha I've never had to see that many films, but it's exhausting and I think it completely erodes your your love of film, it erodes your patience, it sort of wears out your ass, and, and it probably you know, it probably kind of destroys your, your, your ability to use language I think it's a really bad thing to do and I think that's what happens, I think it's just those reviews always read the same way just because of fatigue you know, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous job to do in a way I wanted to ask you Jonathan about the centre specifically because you, you, know, you alluded to the elephant in the room quite quickly which is that you're here as a critic making a film about films in fact and with hints of film criticism in there as well um, and in fact I saw that most of the screening rooms were sort of staffed or stocked with, with critics sitting there uh, in the rows as, as extras um, how, I mean it sounds like you were fairly sort of brazen about that after beyond a certain point and, and, un and unapologetic yeah, and I know that, you know, when uh, Stephen Mangan is rolling his eyes at sort of that review saying, you know, kind of uh, unrelentingly challenging ghosts, I mean, that's the kind of thing I write, you know. Um, I mean, I'm constantly advising people to go and see the most kind of, you know, gruelling eight-hour black and white. And um, But, um, yeah, so I suppose in a way I'm sort of slightly, uh, you know, getting at my own, um, my own taste for severity. Uh, but, um, I mean, I have to say, you know, I mean, sort of clearly the film here is, uh, you know, very closely modelled on uh, certain Antonioni films and La Notte in particular. Uh, but these are not the films closest to my heart. And actually, you know, if I were to make a film about the kind of the films that really obsess me, I mean, they, they would probably be French. And the reason I'm not doing it is, is, I guess I was kind of interested in, you know, going off my familiar terrain and thinking about, well, how, what happens when someone gets fascinated by a film that they know nothing about or don't particularly care about in advance. And actually, this, this happened to me. You know, I saw some Antonioni films when I was in my teens, probably late night on, on Saturday night, BBC Two. And I remember just kind of wandering into one of these films. I sort of switched on halfway through and people wandering around... At, at a fantastic, glamorous party, but looking miserable as sin and thinking, wow, this looks interesting, why? And um, I don't think I even knew at the time what the film was, and, and, and it kind of haunted me. So I just like the idea of, if you like, the unprogrammed experience, because what's great is, you know, I mean, we all go and see films and we know what we're going to see and we know, sort of, have an idea what they're going to be, but when you see something by accident, you just turn on the TV and there's some image that just kind of instantly grabs you and speaks to you you know it's like the equivalent of an earworm and you know you're hooked and perhaps you're doomed as well so that was i guess the idea here i mean one of the criticisms of critics which is often made is that they kind of exist in this slightly airless hermetic world of, of darkened screening rooms and don't necessarily have the kind of the hinterland there um and i think lysander shrugs that criticism off but on the face of it at least people will read the synopsis of the film and, and assume certain things and think well here's, here's a man with a certain amount of professional experience who's making a film about darkened screening rooms? Well, you know, I mean, I always, I always used to kind of groan when, when I heard writers say, you know, it's a write about what you know, and I always thought, well, no, I think you should write about what you don't know. And the, the problem there is, you know, you end up kind of writing something set on, you know, the, the third purple planet of uh, Galaxy X. So I, I thought, well, actually, this is something I know, and it's something I, I care about, and um, uh, it, it's not always what I want to do. But then on the other hand, you know, I mean certain filmmakers, whether they were critics or not, always end up making films about cinema, whether they're supposed to be making films about cinema or not. So, I mean, you know, Godard, for example, the classic example, you know, he can, he can make a film about, um, you know, the weather. 
and it's still really about cinema. You know, you can't help it. If you watch films, you, they kind of, you know, you become possessed by them. And there is obviously, I mean, you know, the, the backstory, I suppose, to this session tonight is that there is obviously this long history which isn't talked about a huge amount of, of critics moving into filmmaking as well. And I almost wanted to ask you why we think that's worthy of note now, because obviously, I mean, Hannah and Chris, I mean, you both write and you write fiction and you also review. I mean, Chris, you review for The Guardian at the moment. And... Oh, not anymore. Is that, is that The Guardian? Five. The Garden Guillotine again. <laughs> I prefer Tatler to The Guardian these days anyway. As a fine um, and noble literary critic, I wanted to, uh, to ask the pair of you, actually, uh, specifically, why in film is this seen as such a novelty? When in, in, as prose writers, of course you write reviews. I mean, it's just what you do. I mean, it's, it's you, you pay the bills by writing reviews of your friends' books, and, you know, it keeps your hand in it. It's not seen... Every single writer on earth has written reviews as well. So why is this so remarkable for filmmakers to be doing the same? What's the difference in form, do you think? Well, I suppose there's a kind of semi-glamorous precedent with, with the kind of French New Wave, and, and, uh, and it, but it relates very much to a tradition of European cinema, which ended pretty much in 1982, I think. Um, the trouble is, if you make films here, um, there's no guarantee that, that you get a career out of it. And I remember Roy Rowland, who made The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, ended up working in a men's shop in the King's Road. And, and when we were working at Time Out, sort of Michael Powell was, was a constant figure, kind of haunting the um, screening landscape. And he thought, well, they didn't let him work for 25 years, so there's no guarantee that they're going to let me work for 25 years. So you very quickly look at contingency plans, be it reviewing for the Tatler or you know, writing books that, 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 and you look at something like Terence Davis, who's, who's virtually sainted, but, you know, they didn't really give him much of a run. So it's, I think it's very hard, um, you know, unless you go to America and kind of make a thing of it, it's very hard to stay here and actually get, um, get a full career. So you have to kind of, you have to really look at um, what other jobs are available. Anna? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know exactly why it is. I mean, I guess with with novelists reviewing of other novelists, which you're right, the Gu I mean, that's just kind of what the Guardian is, really. Um, it's maybe just because it's a medium that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, and we have a different attitude to it here. Um, and I think I do think that once you um, once you get involved seriously in filmmaking, if you're if you're a director as well, not not just a writer, it takes up so much time that actually the idea of continuing with the criticism alongside that probably becomes a bit harder, I think. Um, whereas I think if you're writing novels and then you can kind of sit and read one, it's much more of a solitary process. That probably the two things go more well together, I think. Yeah. But it's interesting. Some people can't get away from criticism. And it's really interesting that Paul Schrader, who started out as a critic before he became a writer and then a director, he couldn't get it out of his system. And he went back, and in recent years, you know, alongside his film career, you know, he hasn't been able to lose that itch. He's been writing, you know, long treatises on, on, you know, the notion of a film canon in film comment. You know, it's like he can't, he can't but get the critic out of himself. But I think that's fine, because you're using different skills and you're using different faculties. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of, it kind of speaks to a bit, something I find a bit of a problem in our society, is that people do want you to be one thing, and they get a bit uncomfortable with the idea that you might just quite, you quite like doing a lot of different things. They don't quite know what to call you or, you know... Um, so I think it's a bit of a product of that. And I can, I mean, I, personally, I'm doing much less of the criticism now because I want to spend my time writing plays or, or, sure. or, or, or film. Um, and I don't want to spend the time watching other people doing it and not doing it myself, if that makes sense. But it doesn't mean that I won't come back to it because I think there are times when you then go, but I want to use that side of my brain. But I suppose on a technical level, I mean, it makes more sense. Like, I mean, I immediately feel sort of simpatico with you because I think, well, I'm a writer, so it makes sense that you, I can understand where you then start writing scripts and you start writing plays. I mean, that move to, to actually getting behind the camera and dealing with the technicalities and the practicalities of that kind of daunts and terrifies me. So all three of you have made that move. You've moved away from the page and the word into the image. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, if you, which I think is the best way to do it, let the idea lead, uh, then certainly before I'd ever made any film projects there would have been ideas that would have worked better to convey in film somehow, but I would have had no concept of how to do it. Uh, but I think there'll always be that instinct to convey some things in words and in criticism. You know, I 
might have some big idea that I think could work brilliantly as a feature film, but then I might go and see Zookeeper and I'm not going to want to respond to that in a 90-minute feature that I spend a year on. I might just want to write 500 words on it and put it on the internet. Um, I think it's a mistake to really draw a big line between the various media. I mean, yeah, there's a certain amount of learning you might have to do to be able to pick up a camera and well, point it at something. But I'm, kind of, I'm interested in the learning specifically because I suppose there's always two models, or two leading models for film critics. You know, And on the one hand, you have Truffaut, who was obviously always very fascinated by the camera. And on the other, you have James Ag, who said right from the start, I don't want to know anything about cameras. I don't want to know anything about what goes on. I will never set foot on a film set. I want to maintain a position of pointed, deliberate ignorance because that's the only way that I can function as a critic. And you will still have critics now who see it almost as an obligation and make a point of the fact that they wouldn't know which end of a camera to point at an actor. So how do you feel? I mean, how do you feel about that? Or do you think now? Yeah, but somebody else points the camera for you. I mean, the, the thing about filmmaking is that it's a collaborative process. And if you're lucky, you're very lucky. You, you work with people who are extremely good, who actually can do it better than you can. And, and I, with Radio On, I was extremely lucky with Martin Schaefer, because he made the film look exactly what I had in mind, but couldn't explain, and better. But then, equally, I've worked with, with, with people who are, you know, it's like pushing the thing uphill all day because they don't get it. But if you're, you know, I mean, if it works, then it works. And it's not, it's not like swimming uphill. If it doesn't work, then it is like swimming uphill. But, but, and, and, and that really is, is, is luck. And, and it may be actually the grip is really good, that the, 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 the kind of the... Um, or the person doing the lighting is really good, which means you get a, you get a set up in, in uh, 20 minutes as opposed to 45. And, and it's not just you, whereas, whereas... And although it's very hard work, kind of physically, I mean, compared to writing, I mean, writing is kind of tillage. It's like moving the stones over one side of the room one day and then moving them back the next, and, and you're entirely on your own. And, and the great... The films I enjoyed most were the ones I made with Ian Sinclair because we were both writers, and we were so glad to be out that every day was a kind of treat. Um, um, you know, where are we having lunch today? I mean, it's funny, you know, no one really knows what a director does anyway. Uh, and, you know, I think no two filmmakers would define their jobs in the same way. And, you know, you'll hear people say um, categorically, well, it's all about working with the actors or it's all about working with the camera. But, but there are some who work only with the actors and not at all with the camera and some vice versa. And, you know, I, I've met filmmakers and they don't seem to know what it is that they do, but it seems to come out brilliantly on the screen anyway. And the best uh, definition I've read of what a director does um, is uh, in, um, I think it's the language of cinema, and it's by Kevin Jackson anyway, who, who kind of loops around it by saying, well, you know, no one really knows what this job is, but, or how to define it, but, but a director is someone who points at people, or points at things and, and at people. Is and, that, does that mirror uh, your experience on La Senza? Did you do a lot of pointing? Um, yeah, I mean, you sort of stand there and you go, what's that? <laughs> and, and you, you know, you kind of, I think, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it wears off, but I get the impression that what, what, you, what you do is you kind of turn up and, and point at things and, and say, what's that? Because, you know, you have to be curious and you have to be, you know, puzzled by things. And I think uh, the filmmakers who probably turn up on set and um, go, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, mm -hmm. Um, maybe they're, they're not the interesting ones because, you know, maybe it all fits together too, too neatly for them. They know what everything is. And I think maybe as soon as someone completely masters that and has no, no more questions to ask, maybe that's when the magic goes. I mean, who knows? Yeah, but I, I found that I actually felt more confident when I stopped pointed at, pointing at things and that, that actually the decisions are made in, in deciding who to get to do it you know, the actors or, or, or the technicians. And then if you get that, I mean, if you, if you cast the actor right, you don't have to tell them anything. You don't have to give them notes. I mean, they're, they're sensible, professional beings. You know, they, they, some of them might be difficult, but you trust them to, to kind of deliver. And actually, you're left with kind of very little to do, if the truth be told, which is why, you know, so you point at things to look as though you're actually doing something. But on, on a good day, you just sort of sit there and you can do the crossword and, you know, <laughs> they all get on with it. You just sort of say, oh, you don't even say cut, you just sort of let them... 
They just say, oh, you know, should we have lunch now? Uh, Charlie, I mean, the films that you've been working on is a documentary. I mean, do you think now that we're talking about actors, I mean, are you planning to work with actors and are you going to be drawing on your kind of professional experience talking about films to do that? Yeah, I mean, mine's much more explicitly a work of criticism than anyone else on the panel. Um, so I think it was probably quite a good sort of ease into the idea of filmmaking to do something I was already quite familiar with. Um, but I think, I don't think there's a huge distinction, apart from all the practicalities of like, yeah, obviously I still don't know how to like put an actor in a place and point a camera at them and turn it on and tell them what to do. Um, in terms of the actual process of making the film, that's been one of the interesting things about making my film, which is a documentary about teen movies. So I've been looking at 200, 300 teen movies and constructing them into a new film. And actually, when you watch that number of films, especially all in one genre and made all around the same time, you start to get a feel for how much each one of those is kind of a work of criticism on all the other ones. And so you notice these trends emerging and these patterns and references between the films. And suddenly, the film that I was making didn't feel like any less of that uh, canon than any of the ones I was looking at because it was drawing on all the same tropes and trends and plot points. And the fact that I hadn't gone to a place and set a camera up and actually filmed a person didn't seem to matter that much by the time I'd got that deep into that world. So, I mean, do you think that, that presents a kind of viable route for film criticism in the future, that people, particularly because the technology is so easy to, to get at now in a way that it, it probably wasn't even ten years ago, that rather than sitting and writing a review or composing a kind of headshot to YouTube, you make your film and you make, perhaps that's an essay film, perhaps that's non-fictional, perhaps that's a fictional film, which is made specifically as a retort to something else and as an act of criticism? Yeah, I think, I think film-based film criticism is brilliant. I'd love to see a lot more of it. Um, and I think especially now that you don't, you know, if I'd wanted to make this film 15, 20 years ago, it would have involved trawling around film archives and paying a fortune in licenses and would have taken years and years and years and cost a fortune. And now anyone can really do it if they've got enough money to buy some DVDs and a, you know, Blu-ray ripper, uh, which I think is a blessing because there are often things that are said better by viewing them. You know, there are film criticism, depending on what you're trying to talk about and what you're trying to tackle, can you know, really use that visual dimension to brilliant ends. Um, so I think whether that takes the form of a five-minute YouTube video that someone uploads and then embeds on a blog or a feature film like the one I've made, yeah, I think it's a brilliant uh, development. Well, I suppose I wanted to get at the issue, which is another elephant in a room, is obviously this conversation is taking place at a time of, of kind of near apocalypse for a lot of professional film critics and economically and technologically... Uh, film criticism appears to be disappearing off into the yonder. I mean, Will Self wrote, I'm sure lots of people read it, a very brilliant piece, I thought, about how technologically and technically film criticism was, was or a certain kind of film criticism, was seeming increasingly redundant. Um, so I'm wondering what effect you think now is kind of changes and that sort of seismic shift is going to have on this landscape of the, that kind of junction between film critics and filmmakers. Because, I mean, speaking personally, I mean, I always felt that, you know, had 20 years ago, had there been no money in film criticism, um, with hindsight, that would have been fantastic because it would have meant I would have gone off and done something else instead and not paid the bills writing film journalism. and I'd actually have something to show at the end of 20 years rather than lots of yellowing cussings about, you know, terrible old American horror movies. Um, but maybe I'm alone in that. I don't know. Someday someone's going to be collecting those yellowing yes, cussings. It, it is me secretly, Jonathan. That's the thing. Is the, the, are the changes in the landscape going to be good for uh, kind of the, the? I suppose what, what we're talking about really here is is the the way that criticism and filmmaking intersect as a form of kind of creative energy, where you're kind of engaging with other films and engaging with the history of film. Are the changes that are taking place now, which is basically the money disappearing, are they going to be good for that impulse, or are people just going to wither away and wander off and do something else? Don't all go first. Well, I was going to say, I guess it means that people can do both and maybe it's not such an issue. If there are more and more people just writing about film because they want to write about film and, you know, maybe more film. And actually, you do get a lot of... I mean, I don't know how people follow shooting people, for instance, but Ben Blaine, who's one of the filmmakers um, who writes about screenwriting and filmmaking on that, um, he, you know, he's a... He, I would call him a critic because he's constantly engaging with films, but he primarily calls himself a filmmaker, but actually, I mean, he would have been quite interesting to have here because he's come the other way around, in a way. Um... But is talking about it from the other, you know, from the other side. So you might you might find there's more of, of that that starts to happen. 
Jonathan? Um, well, I think there's always room for, uh, there's always need for, um, you know, interesting arguments about any art form, whether it's film or, or, or whatever, or about criticism itself. And, and that's what it's for. And the idea that criticism should just be about whether or not to see a film you know that for me is a real problem because often people say well i don't need criticism because you know i can i can find out straight away whether i know immediately whether i'm going to see a film or not but it's not about whether you're going to see it or not or whether you're going to like it or not it's whether there's something in the talking about it that kind of gets your juices going and i know that one of the things that got my juices going as a, as a viewer of films, was, was reading reviews. You know, it just happened that, you know, my local library used to stop films and filming uh, years ago, and I, I remember reading something about horror, um, you know, which was a genre I didn't know at all, but something about the way it was being written about um, really got me very excited and made me think it was, it was, you know, not only possible to see certain films, but to think about them in a certain way. Um... So, I mean, you know, I, the great quote for me, the, the great critic's quote, is um, something that Judith Williamson wrote uh, years ago in um, an introduction to uh, a collection of her very brilliant criticism. And it is a great introduction. She said, I would, no long, I would no more ask a film critic what film to go and see than I would ask a geologist where to go on holiday... And I'm not sure I would go that far, but I absolutely subscribe to the logic of that because it isn't just about, you know, am I going to like Corfu? It's about, you know, where does Corfu lie in, in, you know, the shape of the globe? Charlie? Uh, Yeah, to come back to what you were saying about um, money diminishing and so on, I agree that I think really what's losing out is the sort of film recommendation writers who don't really have a job anymore, but I think it's good that if one thing had to go, it's that, rather than the film criticism. Um, but I think if the money diminishing has made the kind of art form more amorphous, then I think that's great. You know, the fact that Mark Cousins can now make a film for seven grand rather than writing a big feature on going to Algeria for two grand, uh, that's amazing. You know, how incredible that he can produce a 90-minute feature for seven grand, and that's... The, the way that he conveys that trip. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, a beautiful thing that you are no longer, you know, had you uh, had other options back when you seemed so distraught that you became a film critic. You could have done a bit, you could have had some of your yellowing cuttings and then you could have had some yellowing celluloid as well. Chris Petty, are you optimistic? Um, well, a kind of seismic shift has occurred over the last 15 years. Uh, And many things have changed. And one of the things that have changed is the role of the freelance, uh, which used to be a quite um, sort of honourable tradition that you, you, you know, you worked in a certain way on a piecemeal level. That's pretty much gone because nobody pays anymore. You don't get paid. You're you're increasingly asked to do stuff for nothing. Um, Which is fine. And the other thing that's happened, which is is also interesting, is that the kind of image bank has exploded. So we really do live in a kind of age of post-cinema and the kind of things that you were talking about in terms of, you know, how do you write about film? You know, you can, you can, you can do it in a visual way now. You can, there's, there's, there's so much to be kind of pillaged. So uh, it's a kind of, it's a very interesting time. And, and 20 years ago, you were always waiting. And I remember running into Derek Jarman once and, and he, he said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm waiting too. And, 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 and now, with the technology that's available and, 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 and the cost of stuff and the fact that you can do it at home, there's kind of almost no excuse not to do it. You know, that you can, you can, make, you can make a film for next... You can make a 10-minute film for next for nothing. And you can use Final Cut Pro, and the only problem you have is getting somebody to see it, but you can actually do it. And I think that's a huge change. And I think at a certain point that will start to pay off. I think the problem at the moment is that, that all the main media, their response to this, this f- fantastically huge change is to actually become more conservative. They're all dead conservative. And, and, and they're all kind of terribly scared and afraid. But you sort of think at some point, 
the thing will start to sort of tip in favour of, of, of other methods. But um, um, I've got one more question, and then we're going to throw it open to the floor. So do you have your questions ready? Um, we seem to have arrived at a fairly sort of reasonably optimistic, or, or at least not completely suicidal point. Um, I just wanted to throw a quote that was stuck in my mind at you and see what you made of it. Um, the director, Sophie Fines, I remember having a conversation with her. She makes a lot of films with Slavoj Žižek. And she was saying that she came to academia as an outsider and that it was all very new to her because she was more or less forbidden from going to university uh, by her mother, Jennifer Lash, the writer, because she said that she wanted to go to university. But her mother said, well, no, Sophie, I don't want you to do that because as soon as you go to university, you can never be an artist. You will only ever be a critic. And I just wanted to... to bring that quote up and see whether you thought that was in any way relevant to this or if that's now perhaps outdated and a relic from another another world essentially. Yeah, I think it's dated. I think it's nonsense. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether it was ever not dated. You know, I think it's a complete prejudice. Uh, the, you know, we're going back to this idea that artists should in no way be either self-conscious or even conscious about what they do. And, um, you know, maybe today with, you know, the, the kind of predominance of a certain academic conceptual art, uh, there has been kind of a glut of critical and theoretical art, which, um, you know, a lot of people have, have, you know, found more or less arid and, and wanted to kind of slough off. But the idea that somehow thinking and analysing is is some sort of impediment. Um, you know, I think completely the opposite. It's simply another avenue to to creativity, and it's an avenue of, of, for opening things up. And certainly, you know, the, the best critical thought and the best analysis and the best theory is about kind of opening paths and, you know, uh, asking questions and, and raising possibilities rather than sort of shutting things down or being prescriptive or being proscriptive and saying, well, this this is not done. So so I think that's complete nonsense. Now, th this will probably be the most pompous thing anyone's said on the stage tonight, but you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. I agree. I mean, if you think, well, one of my films of the year has been The Selfish Giant, which is Clive Bernard, who, I mean, she's not a critic, but she steeped in academia and that's what you know she spends most of her time doing because she's not paying the bills <laughs> making films although i'm sure she will start to you know um but yeah i don't think i mean i just think it depends you want you want a whole range of different kinds of films being made so you want people who have, have sort of trained in that arena as well i think yeah i mean i'd rather see work of any kind by people who know what they're doing and thought about it you know i don't see the problem with that fine i'm going to throw it open to the floor there is a roving mic i believe hello um, you skirted around it a little bit earlier on in the talk. Um, I'm quite interested because the five of you sort of represent quite a wide range of experience. Um, just whether there is a good amount of dialogue between filmmakers, particularly high-profile filmmakers and critics, and whether or not that is a good thing per se, or whether you think journalists should keep a distance. Um, I think it depends on the critics' ability to maintain their critical distance. Like, it's the same thing with critics who make films and then decide that films are so hard to make that they can't possibly criticise anything anymore. Uh, if you get chummy with Cleo Barnard and suddenly you can't give any of her films a bad review, then you shouldn't get chummy with filmmakers. I don't know, it sort of depends on your personal ability to maintain a distance. I know a lot of people who've done it very badly. I think that's quite widespread. I mean, I think there's two things. I think there's, there's getting friendly with individual filmmakers, which is, in my experience, kind of impossible not to now and again, and you hope that that doesn't colour your, uh, you know, your take on their work. But then there's also, I think, and this is what Jonathan was talking about earlier, I think the idea that you're kind of just getting sucked into a certain world and that kind of PR bubble. Um, and I think, I mean, for me, you know, I'm the least qualified person on the panel to talk about this, but for me, I always try my damnedest to steer very clear of any of that kind of stuff. I wouldn't join BAFTA, you know, for example, because what's a critic doing in BAFTA? Um, I find that, I mean, again, with no causing any offence, hopefully, to anyone on the panel, I mean, I think the notion of critic circles is slightly queasy and critics' awards, you know, because you're, you're lapsing into that world. Um, so that's not a dialogue I'd be comfortable having. Yeah, I mean, there is a problem with that. In, in France, there's, there's a kind of known phenomenon that these really kind of hardcore auteurist critics will stick with certain filmmakers year in, year out. So, you know, even if someone makes a really lousy film, they're still kind of, you know, ah, oh, you know. 
Um, I mean, I once said there, there, are, you know, there are some critics in France particularly who will, will never say anything bad about a certain filmmaker because they are kind of caught in, you know, the mystique and the mastery. And I once uh, said to one of these guys, I came out of a Woody Allen film, I said, God, that was really terrible. He said, ah. Oh but it is the film of a master. And I didn't know whether this meant, yeah, it's a lousy film, but it's a master's lousy film, or he can't make a bad film because he is a master. But either way, you know, I mean, God, you know, there's much point, for God's sake. Jer Jer Jerry Schatzberg was the one in the 70s. You'd have to, you know, I couldn't see it myself, but the French were nuts about it. And, and yeah, also... No, it's James Gray. Yeah. I, mean, I guess, there's, again, there's two things, there's two models going on there, because there's, there's part of it is, is that idea that, as the critic, you kind of have... I guess this is the kind of dialogue you were talking about, that, that in some way a filmmaker would, would respond to the criticism and would actually you know, enter into something willingly. And then there's also critics... I'm sure this is an international phenomenon, but obviously in Britain we have our share who just kind of want to be mates with famous people and you know have a picture of them on Twitter with their arm around Kate Blanchett, whatever it is, you know. Um, but there's two different things. I mean, I don't know if that... I mean, as filmmakers, purely as filmmakers, divorcing yourselves from your sort of journalistic uh, alter egos, I mean, would you be interested in getting into that kind of, that idealised sort of back and forth with certain critics? I mean, if someone wrote particularly intelligently or particularly perceptively about what you were doing? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I would want to spend my time hanging around with film critics. I mean, <laughs> it's what I do now. Uh, I don't moves know. on. Uh, no, I mean, you know, there are, I think there are some film critics who actually, some, some filmmakers who, who do seem to kind of enjoy having arguments with, and interesting arguments with critics. And I think people do it more in France, and I've certainly seen, you know, at festivals, people do kind of enter into um, interesting debate with each other. And I've seen French directors say, well, you know, so-and-so at Kaye said this, and so-and-so at Positive said that. And you do get a kind of... In I, th I think there is some level of debate, and it's, it's not a bad thing at all. I think what's really interesting is when someone like James Cameron calls for the resignation of, of a critic who slams Titanic, because then you do know that, that filmmakers are paying attention. Well, no, that happens more... It, it, it's always bizarre when that happens. It does happen with quite strangely high-profile people as well. Darren Aronofsky is another person who's very... Fair, who's will call out individual critics. A dear friend of both of us, Leslie Felprin, was slagged off by name for having the temerity to not like one of his films. And you, again, you sort of think, aren't you supposed to be above this? Are you really supposed to be reading and then responding to by name? It's always slightly weird. But then the flip side of that... I mean, Chris, you mentioned the response to Radio On when it was re-released, which was kind of superlative across the board. But, I mean, I got the sense, as someone who, who has very fond feelings of Radio 1, uh, for Radio 1, and has for a long time, it felt like a lot of those good reviews were kind of reading the, the blurb on the back of the DVD and then just saying, this film's time has now arrived. I mean, I suppose it's always nice to have a nice review, but is that frustrating when you think, well, actually, this is just someone's liking this because now it's OK to like this film? Well, it's what I said earlier. There's, I think there's very little... Uh, the, re the reason I really liked Manny Farber was because he, he kind of... He wrote about the stuff that interested me. I never... When I watched films, I was always terrible at following the plot. I could never really kind of come out and think, what was the story about? And, and when we were writing for Time Out, we only had 150 words. So the one thing you didn't do was do a synopsis. And the thing that kind of depresses me now about most um, reviewing is that it's, it's still based on the synopsis. It's always a story about a man or a woman who... And you think, well, generally, you don't kind of watch the film in that way. And I remember once sitting in an audience, and, and, and somebody's mobile phone went, and she answered and said, I can't talk now, I'm in a film. And then she proceeded to relate <laughs> the story of the film that she was watching, and it bore no resemblance to what anyone else was watching. <laughs> and it, it was wonderful. We were all kind of sitting there thinking... Oh, is that what she's seeing? And then after she said, she said, I've got to go now and, and, and stop. And, and we were all bereft because this woman was kind of sitting there watching something that the rest of us just couldn't. And, and, and I feel the same about criticism. It's always, they just, oh, a story about a man or a woman who? And, and actually, you don't, you don't watch the thing like that. You, you come away with, with much more fragmented um, impressions. And I wish people would write more in, 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 in that way or write about, I don't know, Somebody reviewed radiators in films once, I remember. They had a kind of... They, they, they had a heating engineer, and he came in and he reviewed the radiators in scenes. And he said, this is great. <laughs> Told you more than, than, than the kind of synopsis ver version. <laughs> OK, so another question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about editing and the... <clears throat> excuse me. 
the difference between when you've been so concerned with editing your own language and then the first time you're in an edit suite kind of looking at moving image, um, yeah, what that kind of brings to bear and how much influence your that language editing impulse has on how you uh, shape a film. Charlie, maybe you go first. You've spent much of the last year editing. Yeah, I mean, my process has all, all been editing because it was all existing footage. Um, I, it felt like kind of the same, same process, really. I mean, I wrote the narration for my film as well, so I'd kind of written like a 5,000-word essay that was then just being matched with picture. And really, it just felt like they were two sides of the same coin because I was saying less verbally than I would have normally because I knew that it was going to be matched with visuals. But that was like a very bizarre new art to learn um, because I'd never really conceived of that idea of not saying anything that wasn't up on the screen already because you can just present it as it already exists. Um, so yeah, I think it, in, it's, it's a joyous thing because it unveils this whole new aspect of your communication that you never knew you could use before. Um, yeah, I mean, I find editing infinitely mysterious, uh, especially, you know, in its digital aspect, because um, there are all these different screens with, uh, you know, different different things on them, which are not necessarily pictures, but may be visual, or they may be, you know, like sort of bar charts or something. And um, so, you know, it's a whole new um, thing to, to, to begin to think about, and um, it's changing all the time. The technology is changing all the time. But I think one thing that may give you an in as a writer is, I guess, shaping sentences, and, and, and it's about punctuation. I mean, the thing about editing is, um, you know, whether in, whether it's words or images, it's a question of, you know, does this need a semicolon here or a full stop or a, or a, a para break? Or, you know. Chris, I mean, you've kind of had parallel careers for the last 20 years or so. You're kind of writing fiction and making films as well. Have they fed into each other? Well, I think the thing that changed, um, the technical changes, because... Um, when you cut on film, you started with a with a, a reel, and that reel actually became the film. You know, you changed it, and you cut it, and you added to it. And and the in writing, the the only thing I ever really aspired to was a was a golf ball typewriter, an IBM golf ball typewriter, and I had one for a while. And my writing was never as good as on that golf ball typewriter. It was three drafts, third draft finished, and then you moved on to computers, both in cutting and and, and writing. And editing became a nightmare because because you'd write something on a computer screen and it would look really you change the font you could make it look neat, and 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 the fact that it was crap was sort of disguised by the by the neatness of the thing, and then you you go into the editing period and there'd just be endless tinkering you'd change the font you'd kind of change, and 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 really to be disciplined on 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 that side I think is 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 really difficult. The, the writing's easier, but the editing just sort of goes on forever. And it's the same I think with with the images because cutting was a, was a very precise sort of craft which involved sort of scissors and sellotape and it was very physical. And then it moved on to being a kind of keyboard skill, and suddenly you'd get these these. Um, what do you call it? Commissioning editors would come in and say, "Oh, can we see it like this?" And, and suddenly, you know, they, they, you could do this in ten minutes, and, and there would be an endless discussion about whether it was right or wrong. And I think that the last film we made, we got to cut seventy-six, and we thought, "Well, how's cut seventy-six different from cut 50? We couldn't. Have, you just endlessly go on doing this thing. So I think it's. Um, and the fact that actually now in television you don't really see what I would call an old-fashioned cut anymore. Everything is basically assembled. Nothing, and the other thing they do is, is because it's the, 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 the cutting process is quick, that's where they cut the budget. So they spend more money on the pre-production. By the time you get to the cutting, they give you five weeks. You don't get a cut in five weeks. You get an assembly. And that's what you see on television now. And it's very, I think it's very difficult to get you know, some, something which is really properly cut. Hello. Um, with regard to what Chris Pettit said about um, the lack of idiosyncratic critical voices, um, as 
someone who's interested in cinema, I actually prefer reading critics who I won't necessarily agree with, but who I feel are providing a strong, considered op opinion. And actually, sometimes I prefer it. For, for, um, say, David Thompson, I'll always read whatever he has to say, even though I have to think he's completely batshit wrong and crazy. But um, it's always a considered opinion, even if I don't feel like he's caught up in the 21st century yet. So, um, so uh, Chris has referred to Manny Farber. Um, I wondered if there were any other critics who you enjoyed, not necessarily because you always agreed with them, but because um, they always stimulated you and helped you exercise your critical faculties and shape them. Um, well, another great example of someone like that was Alexander Walker, who is sort of completely on his own planet. And I don't know anyone who ever agreed with him, but, you know, you always kind of remembered what he wrote and it always kind of, you know, got under your skin in some way, uh, even if, uh, you know, you, you were kind of grinding your teeth. Um, uh, I think Gilbert Adair was a fantastic writer, um, very, very uh, idiosyncratic stylist. And, you know, because he was coming from a different kind of background as well, that was not just cinematic, but, but literally he had a particular spin on things. Um, most of my uh, favourite critics, I guess, um, are American. Um, uh, Jonathan Rosenbaum, who, who retired from uh, the uh, Chicago Reader um, a couple of years ago, but very kind of, very literate, really erudite, but also very kind of politically impassioned writer. Um, and... Um, yeah, there, there are people I read like uh, Stephanie Zacharek and uh, David Edelstein. There's, there's a whole kind of circle of New York writers who I think are very, um, you know, they're, they're very literate and they're very, very film, you know, they're, they're, they're great cinephiles, but they also write with great kind of stylistic gusto. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that's very important. It's much more about you know, throwing those ideas in the air and batting them around and, and doing it in a stylish way, rather than, you know, I think the British tradition has often been, and still is uh, in many ways, to say, well, is it good or bad? You know, put, put your, you know, nail your colours to the mast. You know, wh wh what do we think about this finally? And it shouldn't be about that. It should really be about kind of keeping the argument going in, in an interesting way. But there's a big cultural difference there, which I think probably also has kind of implications for what we've talked about tonight, really, actually, which is that in the States, I mean, you know, actually going and writing intelligently about film as a film specialist is something which is still, even now in these imperiled times, kind of worthy of respect and worthy of note. Whereas in Britain, what tends to happen is someone reaches for a humorist or a feature writer and then they become the critics. So there's a different model there. And it's interesting how much, I think, I suppose it was always there, but it just seems quite pronounced now because people have, everyone has a platform with the internet, which is that for some people the idea of a good critic is the person who, rev who agrees with them about films or agrees with them about the films they think they're going to like that they haven't even seen yet because it's coming out on Friday, you know. But there's a thing that some papers do when they, when they publish an opinion about a film, a review, they put the verdict. Well, you know, it's not a verdict. It's, it's an opinion, you know, because the verdict is, you know, five stars. But um, that, a verdict is about ending an argument where it should really be about it's so fascinating because you, yeah, you look back through and I mean, it's, it's so easy to, to you reach for a film like Peeping Tom, which was obviously critically reviled at the time. Actually, you know, and the assumption is that the critics somehow got it wrong and were stupid and missed the point. Actually, they didn't get it wrong. It's just that somehow in 53 years since, you know, tastes have evolved and our perspective has evolved. But it's kind of fascinating. I mean, more power to those critics for having the, the kind of the balls to get it wrong so spectacularly, you know? Um, and actually, you know, most critics do... I think a, a lot of people would would find this hard to believe, but a lot of... I mean, I think all critics do basically write... Honestly, they write from their response. We, you know, we see films, we usually have to write about them pretty quickly, and we have to kind of grasp at an opinion and get it on the page you know, in coherent form pretty quickly. We probably would rather think about a film for a couple of weeks, um, you know, unless it was... Um, what was the one you mentioned that you didn't want to make a film about? But, you know, um, there are Zookeeper. films... Zookeeper. you know, films you'd rather forget. I I've been thinking about that ever though. since, though. Well, exactly. Um, but, you know, you have to be honest and you have to write from what you actually think of a film because if you're just writing about what... If you're writing the re review that you think your readers want to read or that your paper wants to publish, 
you know, what's the point? It's going to be very hard to, to write in any case. So I get the sense that you're sort of broadly in favour as filmmakers of people reviewing your work, but how do you feel about people reviewing your reviews, the internet commenters and the people on Twitter, that sort of thing? What's that thing called that um, that reviews critics' style? Oh, you know, that's... that's name, yeah. Yeah. Latin name, yeah. I've, I've only got one up there. They've only read one of my reviews, but... It was for blue is the warmest colour. They seemed to like it, so I think I was okay. Um, I don't know. When I start when I start getting a few ones, I'm I'm going to be worried. Uh, yeah, I got a negative review on that website. Uh, <laughs> they said I think they said that I disappeared inside myself <laughs> in a, in a review of can't even remember what I was too busy talking about myself. I mean, Zuki. Um, yeah, that's a. a that's sort of flattering, I suppose, that someone considers that worthy of criticism. It's weird, isn't it, for a, for a dying species. I mean, outside film critics still do seem to provoke quite a lot of um, excitement and agitation, and people still seem to want to comment on, on us as we all disappear into prehistory. Um, we disappear inside us. Quite so. <laughs> I'm, already, I'm assigned safety there already, Jonathan. Don't worry. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I just think the minute you put, the minute you, you're out there, whether it's your profession, you're out there putting your opinion across, then. You're opening yourself up to other people coming back and challenging it, and that's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, I think hasn't hasn't everything now become, whether we like it or not, performance of a, of a type. So, and as soon as you start doing the jazz hands, you know, you're inviting the world to throw bums at you. I suppose is that a tortuous <laughs> analogy? Um, okay, uh, I think on that note, I'm probably finished. So um, we'll leave it there. Um, I just want to thank the panel for joining me tonight. Thank you. <laughs>